This is Don't Tell Me The Score, the podcast that uses sport to explore life's bigger questions. My name is Simon Mundy, and each week I sit down with an expert from the biggest sporting names in the world to Buddhist monks, neuroscientists, psychologists, and philosophers. We discuss a theme that tells us something insightful and important about life and how best to live it. From the importance of self-acceptance to facing addiction and developing resilience, right through to getting your circadian rhythms in sync and how to sleep better. Sport is a metaphor for life. And in this podcast, I aim to prove that right. I always like hearing from you. So the best way to get in touch is via my website, simonmundy.com, or I'm at Simon Mundy on social media. In this episode, I'm talking to psychiatrist Steve Peters about managing the mind. Hello, thank you for inviting me. Lovely to have you here. I'm very excited. We've met once before in 2014. And I do remember it. Do you remember it? I You're not just saying that? It, not just saying that. <laughs> well, it was at the uh, Manchester Velodrome, wasn't yes. it? That's right, yes. yeah. It was a much shorter interview, so I'm delighted to actually have you for a bit more of an extended period of time. Uh, I've got a few descriptions of you and quotes about you, which we're going to uh, kick things off with. So, uh, a mechanic of the mind... In sporting circles, best known for the work you've done with British Cycling, Ronnie O'Sullivan, for many people, the greatest snooker player of all time, the Roger Federer of the Bays. You were described as the best appointment I've ever made by Sir Dave Brailsford. You worked with the likes of Victoria Pendleton, who said you were the most important person in my career. Chris Hoy, another Olympic legend. Without Steve, I wouldn't have won triple gold in Beijing. So you've got some ringing endorsements, but as well as all the stuff you've done with sport, you're a sportsman yourself. This doesn't get <laughs> touched on that. much. I can see less. You do? I think just to step back, a really important point, uh, teaching straight away, because I'm really an academic teacher. Um, for people listening, all these people succeeded, not because of me, but they succeeded because they applied the insights that I was trying to offer them. So I keep saying that whenever I work with people, you pat yourself on the back because not everyone succeeds. You have to put the effort in. I'm, I'm similar to a coach. The person has to have that ability, but they've also got to be determined. And I think working with your mind is the same. If you make an effort, you're, you're likely to do well, whoever's yeah. teaching you. Yeah. Uh, so that's I, I, what I bring to the to the table really is like insights and, and encouragement and, and catalyze, but they have to do the work. And you talk about the mind and managing the mind as being a skill. It is something yes. we can work on and improve consistently throughout our life. Yes. Yeah, because I say, so I say to people, when I meet someone, like Vicky said this, and so did uh, Ronnie uh, publicly, that um, we didn't work on their sports because I start with a person, I get them in a good place. When you're in a good place within yourself, uh, it would behind locked doors then you're ready to go and face the world. But then you've got to stay in that good place, and that's the hard bit, it's the skill. So I, it's easy to get in a good place. I think we all know that. If you lock yourself away from the world and come down a notch, you can get into a good place, but then you've got to go out into the world and stay there, and that's the skill bit. You talk about your vision or your goal, if you like, making people happy, confident, uh, and successful. And sport obviously accentuates some of the mind... Uh, madness that we all experience. I was talking yes. to you uh, off air about like playing tennis. When I play tennis, I will scream blue murder at myself and yeah. feel anxious at times if I'm like say serving you know tie break or a break point down. Yeah. So everything is accentuated in sport, but actually the principles that you'd apply to Vicky Pendleton or Chris Hoy or Ronnie absolutely apply to to anyone if they want to get the most out of their life in any walk. Yeah, I mean. Bear in mind that um, I'm not a sports psychologist. We've got experts in that field. I've come in a bit um, left field from, with this as an academic psychiatrist. I'm a doctor from the NHS. But what I'm saying, like when you go to play tennis, so an example, if I were working with you, is I would say, let's put the tennis to one side and let's first get the right terminology that when you're talking to me about being on the cause, what you're saying to me is within my head, and this is why I use the model, quite simply, there are three systems vying for control and one of them gets control, that system 
independently from the others must work out what it is recognising and perceiving at that moment and then give a plan of action. Yeah. And the three systems can be very, very different in the way they interpret something and then give a plan of action. Yeah. So I'm getting you to start recognising three different systems and then asking you, when you're on that tennis court, which system is working at what point? Uh, and when you've got that, then I'll ask you, okay, what's your belief about the systems in the sense which system do you want to work with? Which is the most predictable, which is the most reliable, and which is the evidence base to getting the best out of you, whether it's sport, relationships, whether it's business, it doesn't matter. It's your, you're deciding, having known the systems, how to run them and yeah. select. Yeah, and you're talking about the your famous chimp model there, you're yes. alluding to it there, and we will get to that, but I'm not going to let you skirt off your sporting career that easily. <laughs> I was thinking so, about yeah, no, you <laughs> Honestly, that was too obvious, Steve. So you are a multiple world champion at athletics and a multiple world record holder. Yes. To just put that into context, it's age-related. I mean, I'm not, that's not downing it, but I, I mean, it's only my opinion, this. I think you have the Masters Athletics, so men and women, 35 plus, because we know we're starting to lose a bit of power and you lose a bit of spring in your legs. So what we're saying is compete against people your own age. And I love it because you make a lot of friends, you can travel the world. Uh, it's great fun to keep you fit. It, it does give you that sort of uh, incentive uh, and determination to think that be disciplined. It's fun. You take it seriously, but it's like a game of tiddlywinks. Now, I know the athletes will be annoyed with that and say it's extremely serious, but if I'm honest, I say this about all sports, you know, I think, come on, get a life. It's, it's tiddlywinks. It's sport. Absolutely. I think that's a really important point. People get too serious about sport. Yeah. It should be fun. And also, I think it, you know, it can be quite a good tool, for example, for developing character or, yeah. or even looking at the workings of the mind uh, like, yeah. uh, like we're going to do. So just give me a couple of snapshots, a couple of the world records you hold, if you don't mind. Yeah. I, I won the um, 200 metres in the world record and I was in the 45 group. So how, how quick are you going around 200 metres? At that age, I ran 22.5. That's fast. Which, yeah, I mean, I tell this story. It's quite funny, really, and it's flattering. But uh, when I was... I didn't know I could really run this quick. And when I was 40, I, someone said, you, you know about the Masters? So I went... Um, and I won the British title, but I wasn't really that fit. So I started training and I actually did some gym work, which I'd never done in my life. I got faster and faster. And by 44, um, the, I got a letter because I, apparently I was the third ranked in all ages for the 200 metres that year in the east of England. So they invited me to Olympic training camp as an up and coming athlete. And <laughs> Amazing. I, I declined and said, I think you better give it to a youngster. I'm 44. And from that time on, I've deteriorated steadily. Right. So obviously now I'm in my mid 60s. So running now is hard. I, I run now what I think I probably strode around the track in uh, 25 years ago. Right. But but still, you feel it's nice to still be fit. And, you know, in a season, if I can still get into 11 point something, I think that's not bad for 65. 11 point? Or what, yeah, are you talking about the 100? Yeah, my time's... 11, that's, that's rapid. It's, that's very impressive. It is for 65. <laughs> <laughs> for any age. I'd have been delighted with that at 21, I think. Yeah, so that's, uh, but yeah, it's for me, this, again, it, it helps me because I use this when I think I've no different chimp to other people. So if I'm not careful, it gets control and uh, it can lead you to merry dance. And you think it's really good for me to use that because I know what elite athletes are going through. Even though it's just fun for me, there's still that element the chimp thinks we're about to go into battle. And so you'll get this adrenaline kick. And if you're not careful, you add all these negative thoughts or yeah. concerning thoughts, which are not helpful. So you still manage your chimp yourself oh absolutely it's, it's a lifelong thing isn't it's it? a lifelong i mean yeah but right. i've made my chimp much more like a best friend oh, which means nice. life is yeah it's a lot better and that's a key point we, we're going to talk about this about yeah. the importance of nurturing your chimp once yeah. we actually establish what a chimp is <laughs> so understanding how the mind works is clearly key if you want to get the most out of life yes. and that's where we come into your chimp model now you you have got a couple of so chi the chimp paradox is obviously the one that you, you're you're best known for but we're as well going to chat about these two new books here, uh, My Hidden Chimp, which is essentially Chimp Paradox for kids. Yes. And then the accompanying book, which is The Silent Guides, which is for the adults who are going to be working with the kids with, right. the, with the other it's book. It's a which, companion book. Yeah. What I thought is the parents might want to understand the science behind this. Why are we teaching these particular habits that I've picked on? Uh, and what's the evidence base behind it? And it started getting bigger. And then I suggested we split them. Um and then they were saying, well, actually, people without children might want to understand how a child's mind functions and develops. So it became a book in its own right. But it, essentially, it's 
uh, based around my hidden chimp. So it's like a companion book to explain the science, but anyone could read it. And, yeah. and I have people, people have written to me saying I don't have children, but it was amazing, insightful, because it makes a lot of sense to where I am now. Yeah. I think um, it's so valuable, these, these books as well, because the relationship between parents and kids and, and the habits we learn when we're young are absolutely fundamental to yes. the way our life turns out. We can go to a good school, but if you're left with some dodgy beliefs about yourself or yes. you know can't manage your chimp early on, which I guess is, is emotional intelligence really, yes. then it doesn't matter how much learning you've done, you're not going to be able to be as happy as you can be or successful yes. as, as you can be. So I think it's fabulous that, that there's something for kids and for the, the parents or, or caregivers can work with them on it. Yes. So the chimp model is essentially that we have three parts to our brain. Right, you have three systems. If you look at the brain, it's extremely complex. So about 20 years ago, and I'm teaching the students, I'm at Sheffield Medical School, and they were asking, how does the brain actually function when it's actually functioning normally, not pathologically? So this is where it started in the early 90s. And what I'm saying is that when we first uh, start life, we have a system which you can think of as being horizontal from just behind the eyes going to the centre of the head. And this is the chimp system. And, and all animals have got this system at, to different degrees. Chimpanzees share basically the same system and operate with this most of the time. So that's why we, we share this with the other hominids. So I called it the chimp system, but it could have been called anything. Um, the students liked it because they were saying, that's what I'm like when I'm acting impulsively, I'm acting in a very base level, I don't think about consequence, and that's exactly what the system does. So it operates in young children. At about two, the second system starts coming in, and this is from the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, so it's another part of the cortex, uh, and it goes sort of vertically. And the second system starts the child asking why questions. And it starts to come into its own around four-year-old. Up to t two to four, it's beginning to ask and trying to get some facts established. Uh, by four, it starts to use those facts. So we've got then two systems which work very differently. And they're interpreting the world and they're trying to make sense of it. So if you shout at your child for some reason she won't get dressed, then if a chimp system picks that up, it can interpret it any way it wants. It's unique to the child, but it might say, my dad shouts at me, but he doesn't do anything. Therefore, shouting doesn't actually work. So I'll just carry on. There's no consequence. And so that's what I'll operate with. The human system might work very differently. And it might say, I'm upsetting my dad, especially if you didn't shout and you said to her, you know, dad's upset. Is that what you want? You will now appeal to the reasoning system of the human system, which is the, the vertical one that says, well, no, I don't want to upset you. And you say, well, would you like to get dressed? And she's much more likely to get dressed because you're using a different system now hmm. that's saying, you know, I want to work with reasoning and logic. However, in children, that's such a primitive system. They're much more likely to get hijacked and re revert back to chimp and think it's a bit of a game as well. So you have these two systems which are basically fighting each other for control of the brain and the chimp's got the upper hand, it, yeah. biologically much, much so. So again, in adults, I was trying to say, um, like it, the diet's the usual one. I'm going to eat the right things. That is the human system deciding what we're going to do and the chimp just eats what it likes. And we just can't understand why we can't just eat sensibly. The problem then is that these two systems are in the here and now, so they've got to put information into the computer, which is the third system. And the third system actually is probably the most important system, which is what the Silent Guides is about. When you've interpreted my dad shouting at me because I won't get dressed and then working out the consequence, the chimp system puts in what it feels like and experiences. And it's quick to sh shift if it feels bad or it thinks I'm not getting advantage. So it works very behaviourally. The human system works things out with cognitions. That means thoughts and beliefs. So when I'm being naughty the child could interpret that in any way it wants, but whatever it's done, it's put it into the computer. And what you've done now is stored these beliefs. So when you now get her to seven-year-old and you ask her, come on, we're in a rush, please get dressed. As the human and chimp make a decision on what to do, they go back to those beliefs. Now, if those beliefs are faulty, like it's great fun to torment my dad, she may carry on and think, no, because that's what I do and not know why she's doing it. If you sit her down, she's like, I don't know why. You know, but we know that she's put that belief in somewhere. On the other hand, she might actually comply and do it really quickly and think the belief she stored was from the human saying, you know, you're hurting dad by doing this. It's not a nice thing to do. So her conscience is operating a bit more and empathy's coming in. So what you've got are these beliefs that are hidden that we've put in somewhere around two to four, five, six, seven. And throughout life, we, we still store them as adults. 
And if we don't dig them up and challenge them, or we don't guide them when we're when they're young children, then we could have children putting beliefs in which are not helpful. Yeah. So that's um, a, a key point that I really want to explore. But just to recap, just yeah. uh, briefly, so we got. Three different parts in our brain. We've got the chimp, yes. which is the emotional, um, the feeling, the, the black and white thinking, yes. the catastrophizing side yes. of us, impulsive, greedy, lazy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, then the human, which is rational, fact-based thinking, yes. more considerate. Yes, uh, and, and then it's the, you. That and is that, you. Okay, that's that's who we are. Yeah. And then the computer, which is the beliefs that have been formed by yeah, the, the, the chimp. backup system, and it stores beliefs and behaviours, which then can take over. Mm -hmm. Victoria Pendleton spoke about her chimp, didn't she? And she said, yes. uh, "I want to. How do I kill my chimp?" Yeah. But you, none of us can kill our chimps. Our no. chimps are there forever. And you talk, it's very important about nurturing your chimp. Yes. So that is talking to it yeah. and but essentially parenting it a bit. Is that fair? It is, yeah. And, but again, it, everyone's unique. And this is where I can't give you a recipe. I can't say, right, what we'll all do is talk to our chimps. Because some people will say, my chimps not going to listen. And so they may say, I need to express myself straight away. And then I'll say, well, do it sensibly. Don't express yourself to the person that's engaged in this battle with you. Uh, express yourself to a friend who's willing to listen. And what I'm saying is, either way, whether you're talking or whether you're expressing or whatever method you're using, you're allowing the chimp to process its emotion. Once we've processed emotion... It starts to settle. When I was uh, with British Cycling, there was a rule I had with a lot of athletes when they came in to complain, uh, and they could do that. Uh, and I welcomed that, you know, let your chimp out. But I said, you have to complain for 15 minutes nonstop. That's the rule. And nobody managed. Nobody managed. And most people laugh after about seven minutes because it's very hard to keep complaining uninterrupted about something. Because the chimp actually gets exhausted and thinks, I can't even be bothered listening to myself. And then that's a really important point neuroscientifically, that when we express, we know that the human is picking up and listening to the chimp and bringing rationality back in. Because these systems interact with each other constantly. So uh, during sleep is when they really interact. And that's why frequently people get up in the morning and think, I see things differently today. And that's because overnight the chimp and human have had this discussion. And we can see this scientifically happening, that the, you then get up with a different feeling, a more rational approach, a more perspective. So the humans brought that to the party. You touched on the computer, which is kind of the, the most important bit. You talk about interpreting when you're young and forming beliefs on the basis of interpretations from, from what happened to us. Yes. So we can think of things like, I'm not lovable or yes. I'm stupid or yes. any of these things. Yes. So how does one go about actually challenging and changing those, those there beliefs? There are a number of ways and different therapists may do it differently. Uh, and it's, so there, it's, there are different ways of approaching this. OK, let's say we got an adult in and this is very common. Um, and they're complaining about their parents, often the dad, was a terrible parent. They didn't have any compassion. They didn't involve themselves. Um, th they didn't live up to it. And, and what you do is you... Th and they then have a belief that they feel inferior to others, they feel rejected, they, and there's lots of beliefs they'll dance around. So we, we first discover what are those beliefs? What does it imply? And then what I do is go back and we have a look at it again through different eyes and say, can we interpret this now? Instead of through the chimp, which is saying, my dad should be perfect, because we all believe that, because we're inbuilt to believe that, otherwise we wouldn't survive, you'd never go to them. If we saw them as they were, we'd probably leave home mm. and think someone could do better than this. But we, we can't see that. So we, we cling on with this belief they are perfect people. And when we get to 9, 10 or even older, uh, we suddenly realise that they're not perfect people. They're just human beings and we're given these titles. So I revisit that and say to this adult man or woman, let's re-look at your parents as human beings and just adults and not as these perfect parents that they should have been. And, and think they're all going to have faults, you know. And when you revisit it, a lot of people start seeing their parents differently. So what you're doing is looking again and saying, what beliefs are you holding that are causing this grief? And the belief there, I'm being simplistic, is my parents should have been perfect or my parents should have been better than they were. And that's just not a real belief. You know, it's a should have belief, which is not helpful because it leaves you in this frustrated place. Whereas if you say, you know what, they got some things right, but they got a lot wrong, then I'll still accept that. But what I'm saying is then it takes that frustration out of you because you're now operating with a human system that says they were just human beings. Hmm. 
But if you've got that logical understanding part of your mind where you can understand that, okay, my parents were human beings yeah. and they made mistakes like everyone does, you can get your head around that. But there's a difference between getting your head around that and understanding that and and feeling it at a, at a belief Perfect. level. Perfect. Because you're working with two different systems. So what we do, start with the human system because now we've got something that we can start feeding back to the chimp to say, have a think again. But you have to, emotion takes a long time to process. I talked about sleep and how the brain works. We have to go over things a few times and we know this. If we talk something through maybe two or three times, we start feeling different about it. We start seeing things different. We come to accept things so it does mean the chimp will keep kicking off until it, it's processing this emotion and that could take it some a uh, quite a number of sessions yeah where you think go over the same thing until the chimp starts going you know what i've said my bit now and i'm beginning to see it differently so you see people move ground given time but if they don't again this is why i'm saying it's unique some people have been heavily abused by parents or guardians and that's very hard to overcome and I, I call these emotional scars and so what I do then is approach it slightly differently by saying we still do that work but let's accept that a lot of us carry emotional scars now how do we contain them how do we actually say right we're accepting it's happened but let's not let it ruin our life let's learn to put it in a box and contain it and if it does get out we'll deal with this a process for dealing with it and then put it back in the box so we can get on with our life mm. yeah um, someone who has low self-esteem, quote unquote, let's yeah. put it on a percentage scale, 10%. Yeah. Feasibly, with the right work and by challenging the beliefs they have, starting with the, the human intellect uh, and letting it drip through into the uh, emotional belief system, could they feasibly get up to 80, 90, 100%? Yeah, again... It's whether they want to shift ground. So I'll try and do this again simplistically. If you start saying, where are we getting this like self-esteem from? If my self-esteem is on the chimp system, which is what I achieve, then if I don't achieve everything at the right level, I'm always going to have low self-esteem because that's my measure. Whereas if I stopped and said, you know what? It's important to achieve. I'm not saying it isn't, but is it really my most important feature in my life that I want? My values then would say, not really. You know, I don't look at my friends and like them for what they've achieved. I look at them for who they are. So if I then remeasure and say, right, let's look at who I am. Am I a positive person? Am I someone who can encourage other people? Am I someone with integrity? My self-esteem can go up because I'm measuring something totally different now. And I can work on those things. Whereas I may never be able to get a degree. I may never win a gold medal. I may never be able to speak another language. Um, that will just demoralise me if I'm going to build self-esteem on that. Whereas if I build self-esteem on being a nice person, uh, on being an honest person, then anyone can start getting good self-esteem. So it's what you're putting your base of self-esteem on. And if people think, no, no, I have to get a gold medal to get self-esteem, that, that is a choice they're making. All I can do is say there are some serious consequences if you don't make it. Yeah, yeah you, you talk about the difference between dreams and goals, yes. which it seems sort yes. of uh, important to state here. So dreams being, for example, uh, a gold medal, yeah. but the goals being those processes that you can tick off along the way yes. that you, you are in control of. Um, you, we touched on self-esteem there. Self-esteem has always struck me as something that is often very related to that, to the inner dialogue we have. Is it easy to change one's inner dialogue? Is it is it just knowing where it's coming from? If you go with the chimp system, your self-esteem will always be based on what you can do, what you have. That's That's the rules. If you base yourself on the human system, it won't be that. You'll start saying it's on my values, it's on who I am as a person. And therefore, if it's as simple as that. If you flick systems, then you'll operate differently and you feel differently. But if your chimp hijacks you and you behave in a way that that perhaps you judge to be um, less than perfect yes. and then judge yourself for that, then... But you... one of the values we hold is, and common sense is, as human beings, we're frail, we make errors, we get hijacked regularly by the chimp, no matter who we are and how good we are, our chimps are there for a reason and they, they mean business. So, but you're forgiving then. Yeah. You know, you're forgiving to friends who make errors. You're forgiving. So you learn to say one of the values I respect myself for and builds my self-esteem is I can forgive myself. So again, teaching someone these and getting these in place and, and really enforcing them means their self-esteem changes. So they don't weigh up. It doesn't matter if we make mistakes or we're imperfect. It doesn't matter because our values are that forgiving is a big value. 
So I'm saying flick systems, but make sure the system is rigorous. Make sure you've worked out what the system is based on values. And, and, and when I do workshops, I do quite a few public things, uh, and the public come in and I say, let's look at values. I'm always surprised that most people struggle and say, I, I can't work out what my values are. What they struggle with is they muddle it up with what's valuable to me. So they'll say th things like my family, and I say, well, no, that's, that's not a value. Uh, that's valuable. Um, so it's very important to make sure you know what the systems are doing, how they operate, and then make sure in your mind and in your world, because I can't do this, I help you to formulate what it is you believe is the right system and what that system's about. And it's unique to each person. And you said that a lot of people, uh, you're almost surprised by the number of people that say they don't know their values. Yes. So someone listening will be going, yeah, that's me. So yeah. how, how does someone establish their values in a nutshell? And I know everyone's different. but Yeah, everyone's different. In a nutshell, what you're saying is... Um, what beliefs do you hold, moral, ethical beliefs do you hold? So, for example, I might say um, one of my values is to respect everybody. Well, that, that is a value I hold, but it's got to be acted out now. So to show you have these values that have been implemented, what do I do that proves I respect people? And often when you say to people, well, how do you show respect to someone? They start to struggle, think, I'm not sure how you show respect. Uh, and then when you say things like uh, you listen to them, that's a sign of respect, to listen to someone, acknowledging their opinions um, and accepting their opinions, not forcing across. Um, then you start working out what your definition of respect is. So you know, yeah, that's my definition. And if I hold the value of respect, that is what I'm going to measure myself against. Am I doing these things? So if I did hold that and I think respect, one of them is to listen, then if I can reflect and spend, I usually recommend people five, ten minutes a day, and one day I think I'm going to re reflect on the idea of respecting people, then I go through my list, which I've worked out, and I think, okay, make sure today you listen to people. You know, and not in a false way, in a real way of saying, no, I want to respect this person, I want to listen, I'm not going to criticise them, I'm going to listen and respect their values, respect their opinions, respect their approach. It doesn't mean I have to agree with it. How important is it for people then to establish their values? The way I teach is I say values are the way that we get peace within ourselves. So very important then? Very important. That, that is what's going to give you peace of mind, which I know you said at the beginning um, when I wrote The Chimp Paradox, it was um, confidence, happiness, success. And that's a lot of people go for them. And I often say when I'm doing the public lectures that um, for me, it didn't ring true because um, I don't really chase success. I'm not saying I don't like success, but it's not something I, I want to achieve. It has never been my nature. And I don't really chase happiness, which sounds strange. I do chase peace of mind. I've always, from being a young man, thought, I just want to be at peace with myself. So, But I was advised not to put that because that's not something people resonate with. They resonate with happiness. So I went down that route. But I think anyone reading it, substitute those things like confidence, happiness with what you want because that's all the book's about. It's trying to say I'm offering what I know, what knowledge and skills I've got and say have a think about this and if it resonates don't let it go. So it could be peace of mind. And it's the difference between doing and being it seems like to me. Yes. Yeah. So the doing is the you know your external achievements, your car, your medal. Which is the chimp. Which is the chimp. There's nothing wrong with that. Because I've noticed this with sports Tennis being my favourite sport, the amount of Wimbledon champions, for example, I've heard speak and they've reached the absolute pinnacle of their mountain and they've won Wimbledon or, yes. you know, or an Olympic god or whatever. And then the next day they're like, huh, I'm surprised. I don't feel like I had expected I would feel. And I think that's quite revealing. There's a golden rule here um, for nearly everyone. When the chimp sets the bar, whatever it is, I get this with doctors. I teach, I have the privilege of teaching. And you get a junior doctor or a medical student who's wanted to be a doctor in five years they, they really really work hard to get through these exams they pass them and they say when I get I'll be later I'll be a doctor and then they go yeah and you think what do you mean and and the chimp once it's reached a level dismisses it so then they say no it's nothing unless you're a consultant they get to consultant and even then they'll go yeah so and I got this with the Olympians I mean I had the privilege of working with a, about 20 Olympic teams and, and multiple gold medalists it is a, it's a privilege to do it um, and, and I get this from a lot of them some don't some are related forever but most say it's nothing and I get Olympians I work with and I've been to now four Olympics and the first or second Olympics I went to they're now saying well it's nothing because there's loads more people got golds in the same event as me I'm just gone now you know, so it's an important point to, to recognise the chimp will chase success, but once it's got that, it'll redefine it. So it's not a happy pathway to go. No, there is this idea, isn't there, that 
more just becomes more, becomes more, becomes yes. more, becomes more. And I'm sure I read something interesting about how once our basic needs are met, i.e., you know, being fed and housed and warmth um, and connection. Beyond that, you're talking, it, it doesn't keep going up, at, your happiness doesn't keep going up at the same rate, it, it levels off. I come from, I've come from a, a poor background, I, I didn't come from wealth, uh, so my parents worked extremely hard uh, to, to get, as it, you know, where we got uh, as a family, and um, and I heard all these when I was like 10, 12, but, oh, money doesn't bring you happiness, and it was always seemed to be said by millionaires, and I thought, well, I wouldn't mind finding out, um, and I would just say, there's a balance here to be had. I, I do agree, money will not come from happiness. I work with a lot of extremely wealthy people who are extremely unhappy, and that's why they come see me. Um, so it doesn't buy it, but on the other hand, it really helps. Of course. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> if you manage it well. So I'm just, I, I don't want to be in that boat of saying it, it won't no. work. I'm saying it'd be nice if all of us had enough money to live on, but there is this point where you've got to learn to live within your means, and unfortunately our chimps tend to live just outside, mm. which means most of us keep chasing more and more bigger cars bigger houses instead of just saying you know what this is good enough some people I've found have done that and they live very happy lives Mm. my granny is uh, eternally grateful and I'm sure that's why like she's 96 fit as a fiddle and and happy always being grateful for what she has and they say that a lot being grateful for what you have rather well, it, than it, imagining. I've tried in this silent guys. I've tried to do this where I picked the ten habits which are in my hidden chimp, and I tried to expand on them for carers to um, keep it light because people complain the chimp paradox was too heavy. So I've tried to do this one a much easier read, which mm. is nice. I had a, an email from a lady yesterday saying, you know, it's such an easier book to read, and I really like it a lot better. But other people say, oh, it's not enough. Um, but I do talk about gratitude and the research on that, and that we know that if people are grateful for what they've got and grateful to others around them it has a neurochemical effect on our brains that actually gives us well-being so again it's one of these things where i'm saying we can teach children this and put this as a silent guide never forget to say thank you never forget to be grateful and reflect on what you've got because it can bring well-being to you so there's subtleties here of when you look at who are the people that uh, are doing well in life and seem to always be in a good place and they do actually operate with a lot of these what I'm calling the silent guys these mm. beliefs that I really should be grateful and I ought to think things through and when I am grateful I feel better Before we get to the final third of this podcast just a reminder do get in touch on social media with any thoughts ideas or suggestions you have I'm at Simon Mundy M-U-N-D-I-E and reply to every single message. In the remaining part of this episode, Steve explains some of the key habits he identifies as being crucial to our well-being. We've got the silent guys and we've got the hidden chimp and you've got the the 10, you've established 10 habits that parents can teach kids to control their emotions and behaviour. So let's rattle through a few of them. You've touched on one there about about gratitude. Um, the one that I found very interesting was this, this simple idea of just smiling. Yeah, the reason uh, they were picked, by the way, because I I ran this, uh, there were 18 versions of My Hidden Chimp, and it was run past uh, psychologists, uh, psychiatrists, uh, schools, teachers, um, anyone who wanted it, and kids, kids particularly. And um, they come up with these 10 habits and said, why don't children learn to smile? You know, and, and when you look at the research, when we know this, our facial expression is intricately linked to our mood state. So normally it comes from if I'm in a good mood, I reflect it on my face. But the research was interesting that if you make these faces up like a sad face or a happy face, you actually evoke the mood starting to appear in your head. So what I was picking that for when they said get them to smile was not just that simple thing of smiling, but there was something much more deep. And that is most of us, when we get out of bed in the morning, just naturally go with the mood we're in. And often it's not a great mood. And, and if you look at this, I look at that and say, why don't you stop and say, what mood do I want to be in? It's this equivalent. You're saying, right, well, then let's put that face on. Let's put the right mood on. Let's put the right approach. And by being proactive, my experience is people say, you do. You suddenly start lifting. And again, like you can match that to the gratitude, for example. So very simply, if someone gets upset at the end of the bed and says, today, I'm going to be grateful and I'm going to go in a good mood. 
And so they go through what they're grateful for and people's experience are that most of the time when we're in these days where there's nothing dramatic happening, we actually get into a really good frame of mind, which again will promote these ideas of it being more successful, better relationships, feel better in yourself. So I'm saying it's very simple stuff, and that's why I pick smiling, mm. that there's there's more to that. There's a much bigger depth of choosing the mood state you're in rather than allowing your mind to choose a mood state and then going with it. Mm. So it's the old fake it till you make it anal analogy. Sort of. Yeah. Sort of. I mean, I, I'm not, I'm really not a, a fan of like, let's put on a smile because your eyes never lie. No, that's you know? true. And, but I think let's get your eyes smiling. And there are ways of doing that by just stopping and thinking, you know, what is it I've always point out grateful for or what have I got locked, looked forward to now, you know, and not to buy into today and what's misery and it's work or instead of saying, let's, what am I doing Friday night? If you're not enjoying your work, you know, change job if you can. But otherwise, look to Friday night and then you think, you know what, I can get through now. So the simple things that people use are always in a buoyant state. Yeah. And I'm just trying to bring that to the table and say there's evidence scientifically of why they're in this good place. But even better for me, my point as a doctor, their health is much better. They're stronger. And we know that our mood state is intricately linked to our immune system. Mm. And so therefore we're saying that happy people live longer. Uh, and the evidence is there. I mean, I was intrigued. It may have different research now, but when I looked at this some years back, there was only one factor for longevity, uh, and that was uh, eating chocolate. <laughs> don't, don't everyone run off and eat bars and bars of it. The, 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 it was obvious that's just a side effect. The point was these people were happy people, yeah. and people who started to think, oh, I'll have some chocolate. And, yeah, and being just, kind to themselves. Yes. Yeah, they nurture themselves. Uh, mm. But in a positive way. But I'm not yeah. saying eat tons and tons no. of bars of chocolate. <laughs> no, absolutely. So essentially, gratitude and smiling are lifesavers. Yeah, and I've tried to put in others because they may not resonate with you, you know. And um, I'm told maybe I'm not, I've changed a bit, but uh, certainly I was never a smiler. And people used to come and say to me, you know, things that would irritate my chimp even more, like it'll never happen or cheer up. And I'm thinking, I'm, not, I'm actually not sad. But I don't these natural, miserable faces. Uh, and I couldn't help it. And but I realise now looking back that, you know, if you actually do sort of like think, come on, you know, I did liven up and suddenly my facial expression did start becoming much more positive. Yeah. But it was an effort to do that for me. So I, I do sympathise with those who say, well, I don't really want to go around saying I'm being grateful all the time and smiling falsely. I think work out what works for you. But there are other things you can do where you think, you know what, that's made me feel in a better state of mind. Yeah. Gratitude is such a big thing at the moment, and I've I mentioned my gran or whatever. But um, my girlfriend likes to went, went through a long period of writing ten things she was grateful for, and uh, as a practice, like I see, I see the value in it. But you want it to become almost second nature, I guess. Yeah. So, and, and is that that old habit thing of you know do it long enough and it will become second nature? Yeah, what you're doing is you're saying basically in the neuroscience world, program the computer and keep reinforcing it until it's established in the computer. And now it's a circuit that will run. And again, it's the silent guy's concept is the idea based on the neuroscience that, like you just said, if you keep on saying, let me be, remind myself to be grateful, you start doing it automatically, these silent um subconscious thoughts, subconscious behaviours start becoming a norm for you. Yeah. Uh, and that in itself is then quite powerful because it puts you in a better frame of mind, a better state of health and so on. It reminds me of when I went, developed a gym habit about 10 years ago and I forced myself to go for a month and I thought, I'm not going to think any longer than this. I'm going to go, for, I went five times a week, really hammered it for, for a whole month. Then at the end of that month period, I could see sort of some benefit. But also by that point, it was a habit. And now I don't ever really have to think about it. It's not something where I have to go be one of these people who drags myself to the gym. I mean, I, mean, I don't go overboard, but I don't have to have to do that. So when you comes to programming the computer, is, is it just simply a case of really, um, you know, getting habits ingrained? That is that in a nutshell? It is, but it's also beliefs. I mean, it's very important that um, you hold beliefs which are really constructive. So we're going back to children, and this is what I've tried to explain with examples in the site guides, is um, if a child misinterprets a situation, let's say that you try and run the egg and spoon race at school and, and mum and dad have turned up to watch and you trip up. And let's just say for sake of argument, it, it looks funny, mum bursts out laughing, you're devastated and feel like she's mocking you, and then dad says, well, you weren't good enough, son. 
And you think that at that point in your life could be devastating. They weren't meant to be nasty to you, but you, I get people who are 30 years on telling me the story. And what that belief system did to the child is, one is, I've got to be careful to not open up because I'm, I'm vulnerable. People are going to hurt me, especially people that are close to me, so don't open up. And the second is that um, my parents were never really proud of me, so I've got to now try and prove to myself that I, I am a decent human being. And you can see how these kind of like seeds are sown inadvertently. I mean, we can, you know, I'm not saying that mum and dad should be watching every move they make, but I'm saying these are the kind of things where if you recognise the child's upset, you say, come here, let's just go over that again and talk it through and say, mum was laughing at the situation, not at you. She thought you were brilliant. You've changed that child's beliefs now. So that is a much positive view of itself that you can fall over and people can laugh with you, uh, but they still love you a lot. It, it comes back to that being and doing again, separating the being and doing. So when you talk about uh, your self-esteem, applying it to the being, what sort of person do you want to be at, right, as opposed to your achievements? Also, when it comes to the child, it's um, separating what they've done from who they are. Yes. Yeah. And, and it, I believe that's so important. And then when they, it's who they are, they've got to feel completely unconditionally loved. They've got to feel wanted and cared for in those formative years. If they don't, we know scientifically we've got problems because there is an area of the brain, the ventromedial areas, which we know very recent research done in Holland, is showing that if a child doesn't feel that security within themselves, this area doesn't grow. And one of the functions, it's got multiple functions, one of them is it actually sort of puts a dampener on the amygdala, which causes stress and anxiety. So we know that if a child doesn't get that stability in the first few years of life, then later on in life, they'll struggle to deal with anxiety states. Um, so, so this is like ongoing research that's waking us up to saying how is important is it for us to get it right as parents? And the golden rule is always constantly remind your child they're wanted and loved and constantly talk things through so you know that the beliefs they're putting in the computer or the behaviours are constructive ones mm. and they're accurate. So in that instance, people who have been scarred in that way, yes. uh, um, is it sort of hopeless then no because i think this is where if i get the 30 40 year old who says this is what happened to me we revisit that and say let's have a look at what really happened and what what was really going on in mum or dad's head and we might look for evidence they say actually yeah they made such an effort say at christmas or my birthday and they surprised me with this and you say well is that really a non-caring mum and they'll go no so what you're doing is you're turning this over and you repeat a few until they start saying, yeah, I see what you're saying. She just didn't add that bit of saying it was funny, but I wasn't laughing at you. It was the situation. Okay. And so you can revisit and reconstruct their belief systems. But it's sometimes hard to get that because people have got this such low self-esteem. Yeah. So you, some of the other practical habits that you talk about in My Hidden Chimp. So we've talked about smiling, gratitude. Um, I like these as well. It's saying sorry. I think that's a really integral one. I, I know um, people who are older than me who still like just cannot say sorry. Yeah, and it's it's actually there's a real power in that vulnerability. When I wrote the book and put it out there, I, I tried to do this. It's a little bit heavy that bit uh, in the silent guys. It's easy for the kids one, but saying sorry, there there are some really fundamental things that we know research shows is you really have to do if you want to make sure it gets across. So if you say sorry, you must usually do a compensatory act to show that you have that. And you must also express remorse. And people don't do this. And it was so interesting that I was watching the breakfast telly and I can't remember the gentleman that was on. And he was really up in arms about something. And they said, the, the presenter said, well, you know, he has said sorry to you. And he said, that's not enough. He needs to do something. And I was so intrigued that he actually said it. Uh, and the research indicates, so I'm saying, if we can teach children, if you've done something and hurt someone and you want to say sorry, there are ways of doing it. One is to say sorry. One is to say what it made you feel, I feel really bad, because they want to hear that remorse. And the, the next is compensatory act. And another important one, which we I see in adults going wrong, is when you've said sorry, the human accepts it. The chimp doesn't. You have to give it a little bit of time. Mm. So what you can't do is say, I've said I'm sorry, which I see adults doing. You have to say, step back and say, when you're ready, come back to me. Give them space. And that in itself can make the sorry be effective. So I'm trying to say, you know, this is for anyone, not just children, but if we can teach children that, how effective is that going to be as adults where we can get over incidences in relationships at work or at home? 
Yeah, I really like that. Say sorry and then demonstrate in some demonstrate way. Demonstrate it with remorse and an act. And you talked to us there, there about um, talking about your feelings, which is another another one. And this is a really important yeah. one. And it, the most crucial. And this, I think, um, again, is becoming more commonplace. People are starting to realise the importance of of talking about feelings, getting in touch with feelings. Yes. Any feeling is okay. Not any action's okay. Any feeling's okay. And... Um, and vulnerability. Yes. That's what it is, isn't it? I think if we change this round, I mean, it's interesting on, on the male-female divide where we know women are very articulate that they can do this, but there is evidence new, uh, scientifically that men are not as adept as women. Sorry, men. Uh, <laughs> I can believe we're it. We're not as articulate and we're not able to get in touch with our feelings as easily, so therefore we are at a disadvantage. But that doesn't excuse us. And I think it's just what I've tried to say with children is get them into a habit of saying, let's talk feelings out because that processes the feelings. So I've given examples in the book with kids acting, you know, between each other saying, let's talk about how you feel about something. And if we can teach men to do this at an earlier age, it might make it validated to say this is a wise thing to do. It's not vulnerable. It's not weak. It's strong. And actually weakness is keeping things in. That's actually not a clever thing to do at all. Mm. But again, I think we've got to be careful that we teach children to go to someone who really cares about them because there's nothing worse, which I've heard again, where some children have experienced growing up, they've gone to someone who's rejected them. So it's very important that somehow we get the child to recognise who the adult it is that's going to listen yeah. and take on board what they're saying because that's so important that the child is understood yeah. and acknowledged for what they're going through. And just listening without necessarily giving advice or without necessarily interrupting, things like that. Just being there to listen and, and accept whatever feeling someone's yeah. willing to express. When I first did child psychiatry, I'd done, I was doing training and I did lots of others and I, I, was, I wasn't actually looking forward to it. Um, but it blew me away a bit that uh, I was shocked at the depth of thinking of even three-year-olds. When you allow them to express themselves and they talk, it's amazing what they know. It's amazing what they've seen and even more disturbing what they've interpreted it as. And that's where I realised this started to formulate in me that, oh, wow, a lot of children are getting beliefs in that really are not going to help them later in life. Um, and this is where it all started, but this is a long, long time, 30 yeah. years ago, yeah, yeah. a long time ago. Something you said there that, that I found interesting. So talking about feelings processes them. Yes. What happens is as we talk neuroscientifically, even whether the human or chimp is talking, it's the human that's listening. So we know this, we've all experienced it, where we're ranting away about something from our chimp. And as we're listening, we're, we're actually hearing ourselves and thinking, this is ridiculous. <laughs> and, and what's the matter with me? Mm. So we actually are pulling ourselves in line. We just don't know how to get out of it once we get going. Yeah. So a couple of the others as well. Uh, let's rattle through a few of them. Um, showing good manners. Who doesn't like good manners? Yeah, again, evidence base is it does the person who shows the manners good. Yeah. So... Well, it's like what you were saying earlier about when you sort of had to learn to smile. Yes. And even though your internal state was was fine, but by doing that more, it, the world will reflect back at you in a, in a brighter Absolutely. way. Absolutely. And people did. Yeah. It did. It changed the way they were perceiving me. And the same is true of manners, isn't it? Absolutely. It's, we, it's crucial. We love someone who says thank you. We love someone who's grateful. Again, we love someone who p puts that gratitude to us. You know, we like someone who smiles. We like someone who compliments you know, they're all good manners. Yeah. You're showing respect. It's like, yeah. you know, giving someone the biggest piece of cake or stepping back when they go through the door or giving them your seat on a bus. It's, you know. It does make you feel good doing those those little things. Well, I was on the tube in London. I was doing a, a talk somewhere and um, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying hard to remember. I'm an old man now. And uh, and as I stood there, a young man just jumped and said, oh, sorry, have my seat. And I was flattered and insulted at the same time. <laughs> yes. And I nearly said to him, I thought, go and tell him. And I did eventually. I woke up and said, can I just say, I really think that was great what you did. Don't ever not do it. Yeah. You know, because we don't compliment people, yeah. but, uh, yeah. Did, were you tempted to add in, you know, but just so you know, I could run 100 metres a lot faster no, than I you almost. No. <laughs> I actually let him sit in the seat. I thought, no. It is nice, those things, though, isn't it? Was it was very pleasant. I'm conscious the time's going, and yeah. I wanted to say something really important Go in on. case we're out, and that's... Um, Whenever I do this work, what I'm doing is giving insights and ideas. All I'm giving is the knowledge I've got, and, and that may change as we get research. So we're giving it. I'm saying to individuals, 
you pick this up, you judge it for yourself. If things resonate, great. If they don't, but it sparks ideas, go with your own ideas. All I'm asking people to do is look after their own psychological health and do some reflection. That's what I think all of us in this field are trying to do. And I'm trying to encourage people not to just ignore this, but think, look after your psychological health. Mm. That's all I'm saying. But mm. everyone's unique, so we're just giving ideas here. Okay, well then to wrap up, I mean, because I think it's been a, it's been a great chat, and I've got a lot out of your work. So a couple of sort of my own personal reflections then to takeaways of this: um, knowing that dealing with your mind is a skill, yes. and that you can always improve it. Um, the importance of nurturing your chimp rather than rejecting mm-hmm. your chimp, or rather than you know having a war with your chimp. Yep. You know, the chimp isn't going anywhere, so yep. you need to develop a relationship with your chimp. Perfect. Um, another one that I think is. Um, really key is is the being not doing uh, aspect of whether that be in terms of raising kids separating the, what they do from who they are yes. but also in terms of how we set up um, how we define success for ourselves mm-hmm. being in terms of you know I want to be trustworthy yes. respectful yes. kind things like that as yeah. opposed to I want to do a marathon or yes. XYZ what would you have as your as your key takeaway I would ask them to sit down and think how important, answer the question for themselves, is is their psychological health? And if the answer is it is important, then ask what are you doing about it? And and if this the chimp model, I could say, won't resonate with everyone, but if it doesn't resonate, what will? Is it mindfulness, cognitive behavioural, is it hypnotherapy? Mm. It could be anything, you know. Um, just find something that resonates and make it work for you, but don't do nothing. That's That was my take on. Yeah, absolutely key. All right. Well, uh, Steve, it's been an absolute pleasure seeing Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I highly recommend uh, all of Steve's books, My Hidden Chimp, The Silent Guides, and of course, The Chimp Paradox, like really powerful stuff. Uh, and w- where can people find any other of your stuff, Steve? We've got a website, so it's a small company. We're, we're based on charity, so if, it, if there's a people support, that's brilliant. I do do uh, an online which call it The Troop, where I do teaching online. Uh, so enjoy that. But you'll find it on the website. Thanks very much for listening to this episode of Don't Turn With The Score. I really hope you enjoyed our conversation and I would, of course, be delighted to hear your thoughts, ideas and questions. Do get in touch via my website, simonmundy.com. I do really appreciate you listening and if you could leave a kind rating and review, I would be sincerely grateful. All that remains is for me to say I hope you'll join me again next time. Until then, thank you and goodbye. Goodbye.